Welcome to another I Am John Cullen podcast. This is John Cullen. In this episode, we're going to take a closer look at means, motive, and opportunity. Step one is to acknowledge that there's no evidence that Stephen Paddock shot anyone at the Harvest Festival. There's no gunshot residue mentioned in his autopsy. There does not appear to be a broken window in 32135. And there's no ballistic connection between the weapons in the room and the victims. In this footage from Josh Bitsko's body cam, we don't see a thousand spent shell casings on the floor. We don't see the broken glass. It doesn't appear that the window has been broken. We run a couple different filters on the same footage, but it just does not appear that there's a thousand spent shells, and that's most likely because that window's not broken. We watch this footage looking for 1,000 rounds of brass casings on the floor by the window, and we don't see them. And we don't see the window being broken either. If the window isn't broken, where Brett Brosnahan is walking now, if that window's not broken, and there's not a thousand spent casings under his feet, then Stephen Paddock didn't shoot those people. Since we only have one body cam from all these officers that are inside the suite, there's only one body cam that's been published. The autopsy does not mention gunshot residue, and there's no ballistic results matching any of the victims to these weapons that are in the suite. So neither the FBI or the LVMPD presented this ballistic evidence that ties the weapons in the room to the weapons that were used to kill and to injure the people at the concert. So the next major gap in the narrative is the fact that there's no video or photographic evidence of gunfire coming from room 32135. We don't have any of the police mentioning it on body cam. We don't see it on any of the footage. And some of the footage has isolated room 32135 fairly, fairly well. If we see no video evidence or no photographic evidence of gunfire coming, we don't see spent brass casings on the floor. The window doesn't appear to be broken. Is it reasonable to assume that a thousand rounds were not fired from room 32135? So when we watch these clips, it's pretty clear that there's no evidence of gunfire coming from 32135. We know from the autopsy that there's no gunshot residue reported on Stephen Paddock's hands or gloves, which weren't mentioned, or his face. And with no photographic or video evidence that gunshots are coming from that room, uh, and the fact that the weapons in the room were never ballistically matched to any of the victims or gunshot wound survivors. There's no evidence that Stephen Paddock shot anybody because the LVMPD and FBI have not provided that evidence. Then we have aircraft in the vicinity that are unaccounted for on flight radar. This is the time of the attack. You're looking at McCarran Airport and the area with the red square around it encompasses the Mandalay Bay, the Delano, and the venue. The venue is right in the middle. Tropicana is up and to the right. And Las Vegas Boulevard is running north and south down the center. So north is up, south is down. We're looking for aircraft flying behind Mandalay Bay towards the venue uh, between the Luxor and the Delano, between Delano and Mandalay, 10.09 p.m. We don't see it. So where, you know, what are these aircraft if that they're not appearing here? We then see Maverick begin to take off, but Maverick doesn't come up and get to the venue till about 10.14 p.m. 
So the question is, what is this that we're seeing in the sky if there's nothing on flight radar? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Could this be where the shooters are and that it's not coming from room 32135? Why don't we see that aircraft on flight radar 24? At this moment in time, there's nothing on flight radar. So now that we've accepted that this is potentially an aerial assault, we go looking for who would have the means, the motive, and the opportunity to pull something like this off. We look at the usual suspects. Would this be Venezuela? Would this be North Korea? Would it be China? Would it be Russia? Who would have done something like this? And that's where we begin the investigation. We wondered who would do this. If you can figure out the motive, we'll figure out who the killers are. So the next step in the investigation, since we don't see evidence of gunfire coming from room 32135, and we do see evidence of these rogue helicopters, is we start searching for, are there any other countries that have helicopters in the United States? And it doesn't take long to find out that we've been selling helicopters to Saudi Arabia and delivering their helicopters to them in the United States and training them on how to use them in the United States. So when we talk about the means, do you have the means to pull off the attack? It appears that the Saudi Arabian National Guard has the means. They have helicopters and they have them in Mesa, Arizona at the Boeing factory where they train on how to use them. So three of their helicopters are kept there. Now this is unlike other countries that might be considered enemies of the United States. North Korea does not have helicopters in the United States. China does not have helicopters in the United States. Russia does not have helicopters in the United States. The question is, does anyone else, any other countries, keep their helicopters near Las Vegas? close enough that they could pull off a mission in and out of Las Vegas, put them away, and there's no helicopters missing the next day. Who could do that? Well, we see that the Saudi Arabian National Guard has helicopters in Mesa, Arizona. Why that's important is because that establishes the opportunity and the means. They have the helicopters, and the helicopters are close enough nearby. we then look at, is there a motive? Is there something in Saudi Arabia that would indicate some sort of motive to pull off an attack? And what we find is that there's been a call for regime change in Saudi Arabia. Dig a little deeper and we find that MBS was wary of a coup, of a coup d'etat attempt. If we go back to January 2015, King bin Salman ascended to the throne in Saudi Arabia. So this is the beginning of 2015. Nine months later, in September, The Guardian publishes this article and these letters from one of the grandsons of Ibn Saud. So this is just nine months after he ascends to the throne. The grandchildren of Ibn Saud are calling for regime change in Riyadh. A senior Saudi prince has launched an unprecedented call for change in the country's leadership as it faces its biggest challenge in years in the form of war, plummeting oil prices, etc. The prince, one of the grandsons of the state's founder, Abdulaziz bin Saud, told the Guardian that there is disquiet among the royal family, and in reality the son of the king, Mohammed bin Salman, is ruling the kingdom, so four or possibly five of my uncles will meet soon to discuss the letters. They are making a plan with a lot of nephews and that will open the door. A lot of the second generation is very anxious. Prince Khalid bin Faisal, Prince Maiteb bin Abdullah, Prince Turkey bin Abdullah, Prince Bandar bin Sultan, Prince Mohammed bin Nayef, Prince Mansour bin Mukran, Prince Abdulaziz bin Fad, Prince Awalid bin Talal, there's so many of them, I can barely fit them all on one screen. Every one of them is a grandson of Ibn Saud, and every one of them is older than MBS. So they see it as they have more 
experience. Their time has come, and that one of them should have been appointed crown prince. Many of them already were appointed crown prince, and then were pushed aside. So, that's like telling them you're going to be king next. Oh, never mind, we were just kidding. So, you've got a list of people that really don't believe MBS deserves to be the next king of Saudi Arabia. And these folks have a history of killing one another over issues like this. The letters in Arabic calling for the overthrow of the king have been read more than two million times. The letters call on the 13 surviving sons of Ibn Saud, specifically Prince Talal, Turkey, and Ahmed bin Abdulaziz, to unite and remove the leadership in a palace coup before choosing a new government from within the family. These are the grandchildren of Ibn Saud. Every one on this family tree has a legitimate claim to the throne. They are direct descendants of Ibn Saud. At one point, Muhammad bin Nayef was crown prince. He's 55 at the time of this article. And according to this, uh, having previously been in charge of Saudi counter-terrorism efforts, he survived a close quarters assassination attempt by an Al-Qaeda suicide bomber. So, assassination attempts and things of that nature are not that foreign to these guys. We are calling for the sons of Ibn Saud, from the oldest Bandar to the youngest Mukrin, to make an urgent meeting with the senior family. Now, this was published the 28th of September 2015, almost exactly two years before the attack. And the way I read this, this is the closest thing to an admission of a coup d'etat in planning that I can imagine. I mean, I can't imagine it being more clear than this. So, if they're admitting that they want to overthrow the bin Salman family, and they admit this two years in advance, and then it takes place on Ashura in Las Vegas two years later, is that unrealistic? So, to better understand the potential for these people to pull off a crime like this, let's get to know them a little better. These are the offspring, these are the grandchildren of Ibn Saud. So... The people we're talking about, every one of them has a legitimate claim to the throne. And they're equally so. They're all offspring, direct offspring. So every one of these princes has a legitimate claim to the throne. Many of them, if not all of them, are older than MBS and have waited and thought that they would be next to be king some more so than others. This, for example, is notorious Prince Abdulaziz bin Fad. He owns very important real estate in Kensington Gardens. He owns a yacht, and it was rumored that he was killed on November 5th when they came to round him up. So he is uh, the son of King Fad. This is Maiteb bin Abdullah. He is the son of King Abdullah, and he used to be the head of the Saudi Arabian National Guard. And he was pushed aside from the Saudi Arabian National Guard in this article. You see how it highlights that he swept aside Mohammed bin Nayef and removing Maitab bin Abdullah. So these are two big powerful players, and he pushed both of them aside. Let's read this from the middle. Wary of a possible coup down the road, the 33-year-old prince thinks removing Abdullah and dismantling the powerful Saudi Arabian National Guard, etc. July 26, nine weeks before the attack. As it says right here that MBS is wary of a possible coup. Wary of a possible coup down the road. The 33-year-old prince thinks removing Abdullah and dismantling the powerful National Guard 
allows him to take control over at least 80% of the country's military and security forces. So two months before the attack in Las Vegas, Maitab bin Abdullah is removed from as the head of the Saudi Arabian National Guard. And the reaction to this is mixed. In this article, it talks about uh, how MBS needs to kind of watch himself. Mohammed bin Salman's dismissal of Maitab bin Abdullah from his position could prove to be a serious miscalculation. MBS is already unpopular with large parts of the Royal Saudi Land forces. Sounds a bit judgmental to me. Some people have asked, why is it important to look at the standard issue weapons of the Saudi Arabian National Guard? And the reason is because we might find a connection. We might hear something that's standard issue, or we might see something that's standard issue and say, wait a second, is that what I heard? Uh, so when we look at the standard issue weapons, a lot of people say that they believe that they heard um, the FN Mini-Me, and the FN Mini-Me is a 5.56 NATO saw belt-fed machine gun, and that's standard issue to the Saudi Arabian National Guard. We also see the HK MP5 machine gun, and a lot of military guys said that they believe that's what they're hearing at midnight when we hear those five bursts of four rounds each. They say that sounds a lot like an HK MP5. We also see the FN57 pistol. We see AK-47s, we see the HK G-36 machine gun, which fires at a rate of between 14 and 16 rounds per second. And we believe that we're hearing those at some point as well. So when we look at the standard issue weapons, do they match up with what we believe we're hearing in the videos? And the answer is yes. It didn't take a whole lot of Googling to find a connection between Saudi Arabia and helicopters in the United States. And this was the missing link when it came to any other research. No other foreign country had helicopters in the United States. And when we looked at these articles, uh, it became clear that the Saudi Arabian National Guard was buying these helicopters, buying them from Boeing, and that they were keeping three of them in the U.S. for training, and that they are part of their standard weaponry. So the key part of this article is the part in the middle that talks about how the several Saudi pilots will train in Mesa, as well as pilots who will serve as instructors in Saudi Arabia. So there are training units that are being left in Mesa, Arizona, at the Boeing factory, for the Saudi pilots to train in. So we sell them these helicopters, we build them at Mesa production facility, and then several Saudi pilots will train in Mesa. So having the means, the motive, and the opportunity means having access to helicopters. And what we see here is that the Saudi Arabian National Guard have helicopters in Mesa, Arizona that belong to them, that they've purchased, they've paid for. Mukran bin Abdulaziz used to be the head of the Saudi Arabian equivalent to the CIA. He also at one point was crown prince, so he was going to be king. And that means that his son thought that he was going to be king. So Mukran bin Abdulaziz, his son is Mansour bin Mukran. And when Mukran bin Abdulaziz was crown prince, Mansour bin Mukran believed, oh boy, once my dad passes away, I become king. He was the head of the General Intelligence Presidency, the equivalent of the CIA. And in April 2015, he was pushed aside. Mansour bin Mukran, his son, wasn't very happy about that. Mohammed bin Nayef, another crown prince and the darling of the CIA and of uh, Brookings Institute, also was scheduled to be king at one point, and he is removed um, from his position 
So Muhammad bin Nayef also pushed aside. And then we get into Khalid bin Salman spending time in the United States. This is the brother of MBS. He's the ambassador to the United States. And he participates in Operation Red Flag that takes place just a few weeks before the attack in Las Vegas. One of the first moments of the attack that we have on film occurs at 9.47 p.m. And at 9.47 p.m. we see this anomaly during um, a completely different song. So this is quite a few moments before anybody else has reported gunfire. And we see this flash upstairs and we made a model of the building and we scaled the model of the building and all that to figure out, all right, where, where is this? And it appears that this is not Stephen Paddock's room, that whatever it is we're seeing here is happening at the Four Seasons. And that starts to implicate the Four Seasons. And so we start to ask questions like, how come we see no body cam footage from the Four Seasons whatsoever? Four Seasons is owned by Awalid bin Talal, and he's notorious for having picked fights with Donald Trump during the course of the presidential uh, election run-up, and he sent some pretty nasty tweets out. He's also a pretty big investor in Twitter. Awalid bin Talal is also one of the grandchildren of Ibn Saud. So he's another one who is in line legitimately to be king. And he believes as one of the wealthiest and most successful players in Saudi Arabia, he should be king. Then we follow the story and it takes us to the grandson of King Fahd. Uh, and his name is uh, King Turkey. And... What happens with King, King Turkey? Is he rounded up the Knight of a Thousand Swords? Or does he get a hot tip from the inside? So Prince Turkey bin Mohammed bin Fahd ends up fleeing to Iran, the arch enemy of Saudi Arabia, and seeks asylum in Iran. So the question is, was he the author of the letter? Did he give the Guardian interview? We don't know. But he escaped Saudi Arabia and went to Iran, their arch enemy. And this is the grandson of the former king. But of all the grandsons, only one of them suffered a tragic, horrifying death, and that was Mansour bin Mukran. Mansour bin Mukran was killed in a helicopter crash. And we believe that that was intended to send a very distinct message. So... He was killed in a helicopter crash. His entire entourage was killed along with him. And we believe that was to send a message that MBS knew that Mansour bin Mukran was behind this attempt to overthrow the bin Salman family. We believe all told there's enough evidence that the attack October 1st in Las Vegas was a coup d'etat attempt and that they were attempting to kill MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and possibly he and his brother. And that would have been devastating to global politics had that coup succeeded. And it was with the protection of the State Department and the Secret Service that Mohammed bin Salman was able to escape, and most likely with the assistance of Maverick helicopters. So... What we saw was a coup d'etat attempt failed, fortunately. But the collateral damage was 59 people were killed and 413 were shot and wounded. So that brings us to the Night of a Thousand Swords, November 5th, in Saudi Arabia, as all these princes are rounded up and arrested at the Ritz-Carlton. Some are held for quite some time. Some supposedly are tortured. And the question is, do we believe that this is as a result of corruption? Or do we believe that this was as a result of an attempted coup d'etat? And that this was MBS's way of dealing with uh, a coup d'etat attempt from within the family. Thank you for listening to this podcast. More to come. <laughs>